Great, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, I wanted to remind you that I, we met a long time ago at a time when you were still thinking about this great idea of the relationship between matrices and membranes. And we have now seen the, the success and the uh, use of it, and especially in this conference, I'm gl very glad to be, be, be here. So, um, let's see. The topic I'll be talking about is not precisely that. I will not mention, I, I will mention the word matrix from time to time, a little bit, just because of the invitation. Uh, <laughs> But I will be working on this corner where it is the ADS-CFT duality. And in fact, we have a very nice previous uh, talk by, by Bysert. So, so uh, I'm glad to follow that. Uh, what I'll be doing is a much, much simplified uh, version of that. It would be, in fact, um, not matrix models, but vector models which are, which would have been considered trivial even at the time when we met, because the goal was always matrices. But uh, I was surprised that these vector models, just an N component field, they also have nice dualities, and they also relate to gravity. And in fact, to put things into a context of what Bicer did, he mentioned a set of operators, which are the simplest, which is the folded string. And it is that sector that, that the vector models would capture. Obviously, string theory has other, many other sectors, and that's the complexity and the greatness of string theory. But this sector, which is essentially a dipole, uh, leads to a picture or leads to a type of gravity is known as high, higher spin gravities. They, in a way, are a poor cousin of string theory. They, in fact, should not exist, really, because uh, they are not string theory. But nevertheless, because of the duality with this simple set of models, the vector models, they might actually have a chance. So there is potentially another theory of gravity which is, in a way, <coughs> competitive to string theory, but it might have a lesser degree of complexity. So, so, so that is the set of theories I'll be studying. And it's a question of reconstructing uh, space-time. I will mention space-time a lot uh, to agree with the conference. And the work I'll describe is with, with my former students and some other collaborators. Uh, this, it, it will not only be that we concentrate lately on these vector models, but we even lower the dimension, meaning that the simplest model, which one might, or the lowest number of dimensions is 1D, and this is the such the Avier Kitayev model, which is being studied a lot. So I will actually start with that 1D model, and then maybe if, if I have time, I move up in dimension. But let's see the details of the 1D model. Okay? So the 1D model is really looks very simple. <coughs> it consists of Majorana fermions, which just depend on time, so there is a Hamiltonian. But the slight complexity comes in the fact that the coupling constant, for example, of a quartic coupling between them is a random variable. So that, in a way, is an aspect of, that's where matrix, uh, some aspect of matrices come in. But it's a random variable with a simple distribution, like a Gaussian. And that essentially is a model. It can be Majorana, or it can be other fermions, or uh, uh, what happens is in this type of models that were introduced for studying spin glasses. But there is a phase there is no replica symmetry breaking. You need replicas because the averaging has to be done uh, with replicas. 
And I introduced another index here, which is A, which goes from 1 and little n, while this capital N is taken to infinity. The little n is taken to 0, really, in this replica limit. But there will be a phase of these theories which is being studied, where actually the replicas will not, not play a role. That, that I will comment next. But again, going back to the model, it started out with a random coupling with a Gaussian um, distribution. If you integrate out j, which is very visible, you will get this squared. But it will be at time t, then multiplied at time t prime. And that is how you get the following formula, which is now <coughs> We have the kinetic term for, the for fermions, which it is very simple. And then we have this combination of uh, uh, the Majorana one-dimensional fermion at time t1 and another one at time t2. And uh, it was power 4, but now it's squared, so it's really power 8. But what you have here is a contraction over the, that color 1 to n, and this forms a, an object which is on invariant. So that's why this is a, an on vector model in the sense that, that we might think of some various field theories. The vehicle of studying this, uh, or rather the observables in this theory, and that again ties in with the previous talk, would be <coughs> this operators phi i of x, any number of derivative here k, derivative s minus k, and phi i of x again, which is a, a local operator with any number of derivatives. So those are the operators which you remember Bicert mentioned that correspond to maybe that, that, that picture. Uh, just that uh, this is also vaguely equivalent to a bilocal. When once the bilocal is expanded in Taylor series. So I will not carry this up. I will, I will, I, it's just maybe notational. So we, I'll be all the time concentrating on bilocal. And you see in this case that this action already involves the bilocal. So, so, <coughs> so this, the SYK model brings in non locality immediately. And that came in because of this random coupling. That plays a b fairly big role for the relevance of this model. To, uh, it exhibits chaotic behavior. That is why the model is selected as maybe the simplest model of black holes. That is why the concentration on its study. But it might be related to this non-locality, which is visible very much here. But <coughs> I would anyway proceed with non-locality because my observable will be this object, which are bilocals. So let's switch immediately to that bilocal description, which I just advertised. In this case, it's only time. In higher dimension, it will be space and time doubled. So this would be the invariant operators as far as ON is concerned. We will ignore the replicas because this is being studied in a phase where there is no replica symmetry breaking. Everything is, will be symmetric in that space. And the, what the, the vehicle, as I mentioned, will be this composite operators, phi of x1, phi of x2. And for those composite operators, we are able to just write down an effective or collective action. So <coughs> here is the collective action replacing the previous action. Obviously, you recognize this, this, this was the kinetic term of fermions, just written in terms of this bilocal quantity. This was the quartic interaction, which is just rewritten. That's fairly trivial. That's all, all, both of those terms are trivial. And there, there is an extra, extra term. That's all. That, that is where maybe some elements of knowledge comes in, the extra term trace log. Trace is in the matrix sense. Everything will be <coughs> in this matrix sense of multiplying things in bilocal space. So whatever formula I write, 
always will involve such a multiplication if there is an issue. I call this a collective action. The reason for it is that it can be, uh, it was introduced to reproduce the Schwinger Dyson equations. Those are equations Kawai san described in his talk. And if you ask the question, is there an action <coughs> whose derivative you take, which would reproduce his equations, then that's precisely the question we asked with Sakita at uh, that long time ago. And there is an answer, and we came up with a scheme known as a collective action. Um, obviously, we, we didn't plan to do vector models. Those at that time were considered trivial. In 30 years, they became non-trivial. Uh, we designed that for, for matrix models, eh? Young-Mills theory. And that is a similar action for which would reproduce those loop equations which Kawai described. But here, for vector models, this is the action. If you take a derivative with respect to Psi, those are the schwinger dyson equations of the vector model. So I will not prove this. So this, this is, an, this is a really an old statement. <coughs> I, now we'll just use it. And any, uh, all the many works which were done on this SYK model, they are done in the large N limit, typically, unless they are numerical directly on a computer. They are always done in the large N limit. And they are always done by studying this action, really. Uh, so, so whoever writes a paper, sometimes there are versions of the action which are in terms of two fields rather than one. And they are reached by something called Hubbard's Tonovich trick, which people are familiar with. But uh, this is a more economic way of writing it in terms of a one field. So, so here it is. That's the action. Um, uh, the study then sounds straightforward. This, this is very straightforward. There are two features of the action which follow from what I said before. Uh, first of all, you notice immediately that we moved from 1D to 2D. And this is in line with ADS-CFT correspondence, where a CFT in dimension D would become an ADS theory, where the dimension is increased by 1. So that is, a, that is kind of a, a very easily accomplished by this, by just concentrating on this set of closed set of operators. Um, and that set of operators, this is not an assumption here in the vector model. They are a, a closed set of operators under the equations of motion, large, large and equations of motion. That is the second thing which n appears in front. So it is already in a form which is the ADS dual, meaning that the natural coupling constant is then 1 over n. So those, those two very relevant features are actually almost accomplished. So you might think that now all we have to do is just do some simple study of this model. It should be simple. It's one dimensional. And that's what I will describe. That study has been going on for three years. And um, first of all, uh, there is an infrared critical point for strong coupling. J, J is, in, the, in this case, that's the coupling constant. If J is large or infinite, this two term, you can scale J and it will move out here. Therefore, at large J, you can just drop that term. I will call this term, while the full action is collective, this is just C, meaning conformal. So these two terms constitute the conformal limit. So you can concentrate just on those two terms, which is even simpler. So let's study that conformal theory. And here, uh, almost again, uh, you, you, you get a very interesting feature of this action with, uh, which, which, we, which we wrote down. Obviously, the action existed for 30 years, but this was noticed only recently. Um, it was actually noticed in the framework of spring glasses maybe 10 years ago, but it was obviously featured now. Um, that it has a reparameterization symmetry. Uh, namely, uh, if you make a reparameterization of time t1 to f of t1, arbitrary function, and obviously t2, f of t2, 
and you transform this field, the bilocal field, in an obvious way so that this term will be invariant under the symmetry. You can then show that the trace log, because of the matrix structure and things only happen at the endpoint and there is a trace, it is also invariant uh, up to an additive factor of f, uh, uh, additive term of f. And that's precisely the feature of, of, of Liouville theory. So maybe those who love Liouville theory, uh, again, it uh, came as a surprise to me uh, that there, are, there, there, there is a one parameter family of Liouville theories, actually, with similar features. And uh, this is that one parameter family if you replace that 4 by q, so that that interaction that is not quartic, but it is higher order and the order q. So if you replace this by q, 4 is replaced by q, that would be a q syk model. It is uh, now a one parameter family of models. And a second comment is that a particular case where q is infinite, then uh, this is Liouville theory. It doesn't, it is, we, we, we probably all know probably several different ways of obtaining Liouville theory from various directions, from, from string uh, and other way. But this is maybe, this adds to your list of getting Liouville theory from somewhere else. This, this is Liouville theory. It's not very visible. But if you just, uh, if you have that power Q, and you replace this by 1 minus Q phi, introduce a new field phi, then this becomes e to the minus phi. That part I now <laughs> proven. That's the part of Liouville theory. All you have to prove is that the trace log will give you the kinetic term of Liouville theory in that limit, q equal infinity. So, but uh, in view of time, I, I won't be demonstrating that. But that, that would be the, the, completion of the completion of the proof. So the statement is it is Liouville theory when, when q is infinite. So, um, but to continue with this reparameterization symmetry, which will in this problem play a fairly big role, which is what I said here. And now let's see what role does it play. Um, <coughs> first of all, it will relate to a problem, which is known always as a zero mole problem every time there is a symmetry. And you are shifting by a background psi zero so that you can transform that solution into a new solution. There is a zero Goldstone mode the wave function of that zero mode is just the derivative of that shift uh, transformed solution by that function f of t. That's a continuous symmetry. In this case, here is here's what you get. The solution for the background was very simple. It was just uh, t1 minus t2 to the power 1 half. When it is transformed, it is just f of t1 minus f of t2, and that derivative which you have here. So if you take a derivative and Fourier transform, you get this Bessel function of t1 minus t2. This will be a wave function of, 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 of a particular mode in the small fluctuation spectrum of this problem, which will be problematic if, if at the outset the propagator will blow up precisely at that value of the conformal dimension. <coughs> But we also know how to treat such problems. That such problems were characteristic of, of solitons or more generally brains. Um, they are treated so that this symmetric coordinate becomes a dynamical variable. And um, uh, again, that was also called collective variable. I am not sure why Sakita and me called everything collective. Uh, it was maybe inspiration with the success of the famous model of Soviet economy. Um, but um, that is also a collective coordinate, but not the same thing as the collective field. Uh, and here is how that 
evaluation goes of what would be the dynamics of that, that, that symmetry coordinate. It will come from that extra term which I referred to, which I dropped, the one which breaks conformal symmetry. If you transform that term, this does depend on f. Uh, there was there a source because this was by local and that term was, was local. So it is that term, that breaking term in the action, which will capture that coordinate f. And now follows an evaluation which I, 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 I skipped, and that, that is actually fairly non-trivial. It's much more complex than in the case of solitons, where we, we could evaluate things easily. The, the point is you have to evaluate things in this strong coupling limit. So that is you know, regularization, and that is renormalization, which you have to understand. And we spend a lot of time agonizing over that with Kenta. Um, until we understood it. So after that strong coupling, regularization, and renormalization, we were able to evaluate this quantity and obtain the action for that. So a similar evaluation was done by Kitar and Su, so we were happy with that. But an earlier evaluation was done by Maldusena and Stanford. However, they were working in a linearized approximation. So the action which you get is this Schwarzian action, which is right here. Uh, it is nonlinear in F, highly nonlinear in F. It's well, the Schwarzian term is well known in conformal field theory. That's how the energy momentum tensor transfers, transforms. But it doesn't mean it just follows from. This is not conformal field theory. This is a totally different subject. And uh, that's the form of this dynamical collective coordinate for that symmetry Goldstone mode of, of, of the reparameterization symmetry. It's one dimensional, which it, it was. Uh, it is one over J, which shows why we needed the strong coupling, one, the, the correction in strong coupling to evaluate it. That's proportional to the action. There is a parameter alpha, which is actually the strength of coupling of this action and the answer is, while we were able to show this very uh, convincingly, that coupling is st still not known. So it is known only numerically. Uh, as I said, uh, Maldesena and Stanford evaluated this in a quadratic approximation by linearizing this. And in that case, they were able to nail down the value of the coupling numerically. There is an outstanding question, even in this simple model, to find that coupling analytically. That is a price for that. <coughs> so, but that is the action of this collective coordinate. I should just quickly state that for, for, for just things which follow, that the same dynamics comes from ADS2 <coughs> in a dilaton gravity of Jacquel Teitelbaum kind which is written here, where you vary the dilaton field and you get just the equation r plus 2 equals 0. So it's a topological gravity in two dimension. It doesn't have any degrees of freedom, but it does have a boundary degree of freedom, as, as, as always. And that boundary degree of freedom can be shown to, to be governed by this very same action, with 1 over g, which was and here, that complies with that formula, and um, some other numbers. Um, so then uh, this was shown by Polchinski and uh, Almheri, who independently earlier studied some details of this topological model. So it was very easy to put these two things together. You just ask the question, where does a Schwarzian action appears? And then, then you, we, we conclude that the Goldstone mode of the SYK model just corresponds to 2D Jacquel title one gravity in ADS2. So, so this is now a result. This is a statement. And great, we can now carry on. You, the next step, obviously, is uh, to study fluctuations and ask the question, what is the full spectrum of the model? So, so, so that's the next step. And that procedure again is, so in fact, this, this identifying the precise Schwarzian was slightly non-trivial. 
and from the fact that even the coefficient is only known numerically, you might assume that it's actually fairly non-trivial. But the next step sounds trivial because I, I will concentrate in that critical region of conformal theory, only two terms, trace log, derivative of that is psi in the matrix sense inverse, and the second term was just psi to the power four. So, so this is the equation of motion you have to solve it, that's psi zero which I already used previously. You can generalize this to finite temperature, which is of interest to studying black holes. That is also one of those reparameterizations by that uh, reparameterization symmetry to finite temperature. But um, to study the spectrum, you just take one more derivative with, with respect to, and I didn't write it, with respect to psi t3, t4. So, so now you get a kernel between for this bilocal, t1, t2, and t3, t4. I will not take a derivative, everyone knows how to do that. So, so you, get, you get a kernel which depends on psi and you plug this in and that's your kernel. That's a very non-local kernel. And, uh, but it is very easy to diagonalize it, to find a wave function which will diagonalize that kernel. Because of, uh, we are in, co in the conformal limit, there is an SL2 symmetry, which is the dilatations plus uh, conformal symmetry plus translations. But now what is operational on that by local is the, just the by local SL2R, meaning you have to copy for translations D1 plus D2 and from dilatations T1, D1, T2, D2. So it's a very simple implementation of double of, of double of the very simple 1D conformal symmetry and then the, the K. If you compute that, you get the very simple answer. The Casimir of this SL2 is T1 minus T2, D1, T2. Uh, you can think of this as some kind of basic uh, Laplacian in this bilocal space. It will not be D1 squared plus D2 squared or something like that. It is this a Casimir of SL2, which is the Laplacian in bilocal space. <coughs> we'll make some further comments on that Laplacian that will have a space-time interpretation. And the eigenfunctions are the conformal or the related to conformal blocks. They are general three-point functions with an arbitrarily conformal weight H. Those functions look like that. There will be an eigenfunctions of the Casimir that is well known in any dimension. Um, so you, you use that for one dimension. Uh, you do a Fourier transform maybe, so there will be two quantum numbers. We are in two dimension. The quantum numbers will be H and omega. Um, uh, if you do a Fourier transform of what I did before, you essentially get a plane wave, e to the i omega t1 plus t2, that's the center of mass of the bilocal, and this is t1 minus t2 and the function z, which is a linear combination of Bessel functions. It would be the wave function in ADS, except for this, this, this second term. A second term comes with a fairly non-trivial coefficients. Because of that, um, on shell, when you now ask what, what is the on shell, what are the on shell values for this conformal weight mu, you get an equation. This equation will actually have not one solution, which you might have expected, because we basically would want one scalar field in two dimensions. But it has, this is a transcendental equation well known to everyone who teaches quantum mechanics. Uh, it's a transcendental equation which has infinitely many solutions. Those are the, that's the spectrum of the SYK. There will be an infinite number of states. And if you now ask the question that by local kernel, how does, how should I picture that? Here is how you should picture that. It is really an infinite product of Laplacians in ADS2 um, with growing masses, because if those growing masses are precisely of this form, then they, this is what, what agrees with that infinite spectrum. So, so this probably tells you that I, I, I began saying we'll be studying a simple model of uh, 
a simple model. Th this actually is not such a simple model at all. This is a fairly complex, you know, uh, uh, it is in one dimension, but it, for example, comes with this kind of non-local, extremely non-local Laplacian. So that, but that is the spectrum, that's the answer, which just comes from evaluation of that quadratic eigenvalue problem, which, which, which was so easy to write down. Okay. And this interacts with this gravity degree of freedom, which is the Schwarzian. So we have some matter interacting with the Schwarzian degree of freedom. I should maybe tell you where I'm going by studying this model slowly and through the last several years. We are trying, I, sh I, I forgot to tell you, we do not know what the dual is in this case. It is not like the beautiful case you had previously, where the dual was stated very clearly. It's, it's 10 dimensional super string theory. In this case, we have no idea what the dual is. We know what the CFT theory is. We would like to know what the dual is. We know this is a nice theory to study black holes and do maybe possibly non perturbative physics. And we are maybe trying to figure out the dual. So at this point, you have this highly non polynomial action and uh, the Schwarzian degree of freedom, which is really two dimensional gravity. Uh, that is a 3D picture, as I said, that formula which identify the, the masses, that was reminiscent of something. If you, study, if you study a quantum mechanical problem in the third dimension, so that, that has something to do with certain version of kaluza klein but a very peculiar version of kaluza klein you, you can understand that non -poly, infinitely polynomial, non-polynomial Lagrangian or Laplacian from going from a standard scalar field theory in three dimension. And this is what we have kind of figured out with Das and Kenta. And this works very simply. So you are in three dimension, gravity coupled to a scalar in three dimension. Two are ADS. And the third is that Kaluza-Klein dimension, which will have to give us some desirable result once we we evaluate what's going on in this third dimension. So we obviously will fit things. We will say that that extra dimension will be compact. And at y equals 0, there will be a delta function spike, which I didn't write. But in that case, the spectrum is given by that equation from quantum mechanics of momenta being given, decided by a transcendental equation. So you can be in three, so, you, so that spectrum looks like coming from th th the third dimension not, not of space-time. Um, and the test for that is really to evaluate that propagator in third dimension. And if you evaluate the propagator in third dimension and take it at y <coughs> equals zero, you get this answer, sum over those m's, with the right values for PMs, the right conformal weights, and with the right wave function, which I featured before. So uh, I never wrote down the propagator for the SYK model, because I knew I will, I, I didn't want to repeat it, writing it down. So, so here, here comes the same propagator from third dimension, where this is how we go down to, to the SYK. Obviously, all the other degrees of freedom are being integrated out in that Lagrangian that I wrote. So this um, might look that we are out of the woods. But in a way, the interesting stuff is just beginning. So let me prepare you that this will be, I, I hope, not an endless uh, situation of new things in the trivial model. But nevertheless, there will be some there is a further question. So number three, uh, we, we understood the ma matter sector, we understood the gravity sect, gravity degrees of freedom, but here is a question of space-time. Uh, and this is in the end, is honor, space-time. So if you just make the com combination T1, T2, and T1 minus T2, that's trivial. But that Casimir, which I mentioned, is this, that's the, the Sitter-Casimir. 
or the decidual Laplacian or the anti decidual Laplacian. In, in two dimension, it is always SO12 or SO21. You cannot distinguish wh which one is it. Is it the sitter? Is it anti the sitter? Um, because, so, so that's the question now. So, so obviously, you ask the question is it the sitter, which would be maybe even more interesting if this theory gave the sitter space? But it will not be so. So first of all, there is this comment on the question, is it the sitter or anti the sitter? You say, let's look at those wave functions, z, which had that linear combination with that strange factor be between two Bessel functions. And those who know the sitter wave functions know that there is an infinite pos number of possibilities in the sitter called uh, alpha vacua. They all lead to different type of excitations. This is a particular alpha vacuum. You just specify the value alpha, and we, we, I, we, it's very simple in terms of nu. And uh, the, the well-known the sitter wave functions in the alpha vacuum will agree precisely with this formula. So you might say then, well, OK, now maybe this is the end. This is the sitter, and um, you are in particular alpha vacuum. and. Uh, that's what you are. That's what the SYK is studying, and um, right, this, these are the alpha vacuum that have a, a charge at the antiboard. That's right. Yeah, the, the standard alpha vacuum, which you just opened the books or on the sitter, or the paper by Allen, who first wrote it down. Um, so looks fine, uh, but there is a problem, and uh, I, I'm sorry, but there is a problem. <coughs> the problem is the problem of an eye which goes as follows. I should say, that, and, and someone should have noticed it, uh, uh, or, or because we were studying the partition function. That was an Euclidean problem. We, we studied the trace of e to the minus beta h, maybe at infinite in that time. But nevertheless, it was an Euclidean SYK model that I was starting with and studying all the time. Nevertheless, it seems to have something to do with well, the spectrum is that of a Lorentzian problem. So you, you, I don't think you have ever seen anything like this, that you started out with studying a Euclidean problem and looked at the fluctuations and you encountered a Lorentzian Laplacian. Uh, there was no mistake in the algebra, so that's just a fact. So this collective field theory, sorry, was like this. It came with minus that collective action. It was based on Euclidean logic of deriving it. But even though it was Euclidean, the small fluctuation spectrum looks, uh, looks Lorentzian. Uh, you either say this is some kind of contradiction. Maybe this theory is sick, because <coughs> for a Lorentzian theory, we would have matter, matter coupled to gravity, much I like had, but there would be an i. And then all the endpoint function, that i is not ir irrelevant. That, that is there for a reason. So then, that it, then simply you would say you will not be able to claim agreement of this with anything like that. That i is, is, is an obstruction. Unless you agree to study Lorentzian, Laplacians without an i in front of the action, and that you will not agree. But um, oh, so, so that's, the, that's the, the, the problem at this point in time of making a statement, what is the space time? We, we were thinking between the sitter and anti the sitter. The point is that none of them is really a possible answer. It must be the answer, actually, we know. It probably, it, no, it must be. Euclidean anti the sitter. We, we are studying an Euclidean problem. Standard ADS CFT would say it's an Euclidean anti the sitter, so you better exhibit Euclidean anti the sitter. It's possible to do that. There is a transform. And I should say that in this bilocal theory, and it especially becomes visible in higher dimension, in this d equal 1, things are a little bit misleading. But in higher, x1, x2 is a bilocal. That's not really a space time of any kind. It's just an anomaly that in d equal 1, that Casimir was so simple that it looked like the sitter. But uh, that was just a, a special case 
of, of d equal 1. If you study things in higher dimension, you would not even see anything recognizable. For the, for the Casimir of the bilocal, it would not be a recognizable space-time. So you would, you would immediately know that to go to the space-time, probably there is some transformation. Uh, the simplest point is maybe to do a coordinate transformation between this bilocal to maybe some physical space-time. It's actually close to that, <coughs> but not a coordinate transformation. It will be a coordinate transformation in momentum space. It will be a moment, the next simplest possibility. Either I will make change of coordinates or I will maybe make change of momenta. If it's anything more complicated than that, then I'm in trouble if I have to do canonical transformation, which, which involve both coordinates and momenta. And here is the answer of that transform. In fact, it's a very well-known transform. It's called the Radon transform. It, it looks like as follows. You transform for this bilocal space here, uh, you, you remember eta and t, to an Euclidean ADS space. And you might have an Euclidean ADS wave function, and you will get our wave function, which is the bilocal wave function. The Radon transform has a, you know, even greater use than the membrane matrix duality because it's so everywhere in the CAT scan. So, so yes, you still have a way to go to achieve such a such an important as Mr. Radon. Uh, it is uh, it is a transform which is which is just obviously it, it's a transform which allows for recovering the image in in, in CAT scans. Uh, why, does appear, why, why does it appear here? I don't know. But I know how to understand it from our discussion. Namely, we, we, and this will be true in other higher dimensions. This is not only for one dimension. Such map is required because the conformal group is realized differently. Here, with the, in the bilocal, we had two copies of just uh, standard CFT realization of the conformal group. But in the dual ADS theory, we have standard curved space ADS realizations of the conformal group. So it's a very simple question. Why don't you just take the generators of SL, of realization of the conformal group on your bilocal, which are, here is the dilatation, T1, P1, T2, P2, P1, P2, and the conformal, T1 squared, P1, P2. And you go to Euclidean ADS, tau p tau plus z p z, that all standard. And this is how the analog of conformal k looks in ADS space. So you say, just make an identification that this should agree with each other and figure out what transformation you have to make between the bilocal realization of the conformal group and the actual space time realization of the conformal group. This equation, uh, this is a nice, nice. Um, I guess, advanced group theory problem in the class to ask that question because there is an answer. And remarkably, the answer involves something which is very obvious, that this is a center of mass. And then PZ, that's the extra dimension of ADS. This is a formula for what Z is actually. That's Z, in, in our case, is never holographic, we, even though I use the term by local holography. Because I'm bilocal, everything is being recovered, in particular z, or its conjugate is being recovered from, 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 from the CFT coordinates. But it's a momentum change. It's a change in momentum space. It's not a change in coordinate space. It's changing a momentum space. And if you evaluate the kernel of this kind of momentum kernel, very simple in this ca case, you, that's one new way to get the radon transform. That's not how radon got, got it. But this would be our way, because that's how, our, we, that's how we met the problem in this case. So it's a change of coordinates in momentum space. And if you Fourier transform that in these four variables, then you, you get that radon transform. So OK, then the radon transform will take us to the Euclidean ADS space. And you might think, good, this is maybe the end of this. 
we finally are happy. We have, we are now, our theory is now in Euclidean ADS. Everything is consistent. Uh, 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 almost true. Uh, there is still a kind of uh, uh, some very unusual feature going on in this case, which will have some relevant consequences, which I hope I'll be able trans to transmit. Don't you have a problem of signs? I mean, z squared. Uh, uh, no, I, I probably, squared. I probably, yeah, yeah. I probably kept all my si sign straight, or at no, least. What I mean is that some quantities were positive. Oh, oh very much. No. That's the next issue. You, you spotted the issue, OK? So let's go to that issue, OK? Um, it transforms a De Sitter Laplacian into an Euclidean De Sitter Laplacian. If I concentrate not on the time, but space, and just to maybe introduce exponentiation of variables y and De Sitter, this, this is what is being transformed. It's a Liouville type potential minus into plus. So, so, and that, that is very visible why this happened. You know, this is the consequence, the fact that I'm transforming an Euclidean to a Minkowskian problem. You are transforming a potential which, is, which looks like But before anyone gets negative, I should say that's what the radon transform does. It transforms a problem. And uh, you all go for examinations, so you trust the radon transform. So it is this problem into that problem. They are very different. There are only scattering states here reflections of that Liouville wall. And there are scattering states here, but also bound states here, in fact, an infinitely many. So you are transforming a problem with bound states to a problem with, not, not you, but Radon is transforming a problem with bound states into no bound states. That has a simple consequence, which I will state, and then I wrap it up, at least what we have learned. If you take a normalized wave function in one of the spaces Euclidean, you do not get a normalized wave function in the other space. You get a lag factor. The lag factor is this ratio of gamma functions. Those gamma functions have poles precisely where those bound states are. So it is something we would expect. You, you say there must be some way that, that this problem here is equivalent to this problem, but there must be some extra accounting for the fact that there can be bound states. So there are lag, lag factors. These I call lag factors, but there are factors between the two wave functions. And then this is the final result. So if I take the bilocal propagator, which I had, which had some over those wave functions, but now I am in Euclidean space, the only price I pay for this Euclidean space is this extra factors, because that that's what the red, and that, that those extra factors have those poles because I transformed one problem with bound states into a problem with no bound states. So this is the proposed answer then of what the propagator of this theory is in maybe what we think is a physical space, meaning Euclid it's Euclidean at least, but it has these lag factors. Okay. Uh, Maybe then that, that has a lot of physics in it. In addition to those poles which are here, those are the solution to that I already discussed. Those are those massive states. There are now poles which are also there. So there is an extra set of states. At least this is what one is, one is predicting. And that's what I said here. Now, um, and this is my chance to mention a matrix. Uh, if you think that this story is maybe confusing, uh, this what I did here, I just repeated something which I probably gave a lecture on, you know, in 1990, in an identical way, with, with, with the identical, uh, you know, just, just a slight change, of, slight change of terms. At that time, the duality which we studied was between a C equal one matrix model and in that case, the dual was known, identified from first numerical studies. Uh, uh, the 2D 
non-critical string theory. This is really a predecessor of ADS-CFT and has been studied at that time in detail with precisely this sequence of uh, you know, uh, statements. Um, I don't, I'm not sure, Jens, how much time I have. Oh, you have five more minutes. Oh, I then I certainly don't have time to go to two, three and higher dimension. This is still one, I'm still stuck in one dimension, but let me then complete the one dimensional story because Maybe I will just illuminate this statement so that there is some connection to a matrix model. After all that, I use the word space-time sufficiently many times. So let me then switch to the matrix. So that matrix model was, was this model. <coughs> and um, with a potential, in fact, the potential was a simple upside-down harmonic oscillator potential. So in that sense, it's a very solvable theory on, on the outset. And the collective field, which is the analog of this bilocal, was the distribution of eigenvalues, which then led, this is the density, and led to two dimensions. So it is again the equal one, and the collective description is in terms of d equal two. In that case, it was even simpler to do, uh, I, I will not write down the, the, the field theory which governs the large n, and those Schwinger Dyson equations, which, which I mentioned. But after you linearize everything and evaluate the quadratic uh, collective uh, Laplacian, it just gets to be this, this one. So it's a standard Laplacian in two dimensions. So you immediately jump at the statement oh, this is just a massless scalar field, the spin zero scalar, in two dimensions. And the 2D string, which this is supposed to be describing, does have such a state. It's only the center of mass of this. It's a closed string, but open or closed. And that would have been a tachyon. That's the scalar. That's the would-be tachyon in other dimension. But if you remember string theory uh, for non-critical strings, that mass is equal to 2, 2 minus d. So it would be tachyon in 26. But in d equal 2, it's precisely massless. So this is a, a winner, this model. That's why it describes 2 d string theory. But uh, that's kind of not enough. And that's where the long story start along the same line which I was proceeding before. You say, but this I know cannot be the, the actual space time, time and some other Lorentzian, Lo this, this is now Lorentz invariant. The 2D non-critical string theory involves, uh, you know, the second dimension is not a C equal one conformal field but the Louisville conformal field. And then the Laplacian would be at best, at that, you know, this would be the Laplacian. But there is a transformation between this Laplacian and the one I wrote down. And then if you work out the transformation, you get again an extra factor. It is the same story that you, you, you transform now to this Louisville description, which is the right space time, but you get a factor, and this is the factor. This is the pole, which is that massless scalar of 2D string, but an infinite number of poles, this. Um, I should say that even though I discovered, or with Schumit Das, we discovered this contribution, actually this contribution, which was discovered by others, is much more important. That lag factor is actually much more important than the main excitation which was the tachyon because it's the lag factor which tells you this is string theory otherwise it could be just a scalar field in two dimension you say why 2d string theory the lag factor and this is now the correct answer this was written down by i should give credit to those people whom i learned this from and that we learned this from from that time it's uh, more cyber and staudacher it was a very nice work they identify those the, 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 the propagator of this 2D matrix model, but now it looks like a propagator in Liouville theory, but it has an infinite number of extra contribution at these values, P equal I N. Those are called discrete states, at imaginary values of momenta. Those discrete states were confirmed by Polyakov because 2D string theory, even though it should have no degrees of freedom, if you are very, very careful, 
as Polyakov was, you will analyze, for example, here is just, you can do the exercise for spin one. This is momentum, this is a shift due to Liouville, the background charge for the non-critical string. And this would be the, the equation of motion, for example, S equal one. Mm. This would be the gauge condition, the Lorentz, Lorentz gauge condition. Then you know, to remove the other degree of freedom, you would use an on-shell gauge transformation, and then two minus two is zero. So you conclude that the two-dimensional gauge theory has no degrees of freedom. But Polyakov noticed that when P is equal to minus Q, for that one special value of momenta, there is no chance to use this uh, re remedial gauge transformation. And therefore, there is a physical state at P equal minus two. That's the first discrete state. That's the origin of this discrete state. That's also the origin of Schwarzian degree of freedom. <coughs> so then you start analyzing the string to all other degree, all, all other higher levels, and you find a perfect agreement with where these poles of these lag factors are. So then you have a complete agreement with 2D string theory, and you, you at that point are very happy. So in this case, we do not have, in this case, this is in a way a prediction of what we accomplished with Kenta and Shumi Das. We are claiming the following, that this simple one-dimensional field theory, a uh, strongly correlated theory in, uh, is equal to some gravity in two or three dimensions. It has this soft mode called the graviton. It has an infinite sequence of matter fields which are easy to find, but those can be also understood for one higher dimension, which by Kaluza Klein. But it also has an infinite sequence of discrete states, uh, which, which I just <coughs> featured. So all three are then, that's, the, that's uh, according to what we believe at this point, would be the complete spectrum of this theory. And then it's anyone's guess, it's, a, it's again a challenge, and uh, the answer is not known. W what is this theory? We, we, we have a proposal, we have something which we, we think that is the spectrum, and the question is, what is the theory? So in this case, the dual is not known. For the higher dimensional case, the dual is known. It's Vasilyev's highest, highest spin theory. It's only in this case where the dual is not known, and it's a challenge to find it. Thanks. Thanks, Jens. Thanks very much for an interesting talk. I will not mention what I asked you to talk about, but it's very interesting. But OK, I thought this is what you, I mentioned space time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. no, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting. For me personally, also, it's the first mm -hmm. PowerPoint I see from you. So oh, I see, OK. <laughs> that's thanks, thanks to Kanta, really. Questions and mm -hmm. comments. Uh, is there any natural regularization of the theory that would allow to go from the weakly to the strongly correlated theory? Um, in, a, in a way, you, you, that parameter j, mm -hmm. it's, up to, it's, your, it's still under your control. You can study the weak coupling theory. And there could be a yeah. an exact normalization group though? Uh, that there could be, and in fact, you know, from the way uh, Kitai wrote his paper, you might think that he might is discussing that, but I didn't see it in his paper, and that's in a way something to discuss. I, I don't think that was done. So you said, well, if you take a Q infinity limit, you have Liouville, right? Right. So is Liouville also has three-dimensional structure? Mm -hmm. Ah, that's a good point. Okay, so, and that this can be analyzed. Uh, Liouville only takes, only keeps the, that h equal to, the, the lowest of those scalars. You know, there was a sequence of scalars, I call them PM, and the lowest one actually is the Liouville, and the others uh, decouple. You can analyze that in the propagator, the residue of the pole is proportional to one over Q for the others, except for one. 
So that's why you get a nice theory that de describes what you expect. There is one scalar field, the Louisville. That's precisely the lowest mode of those scalars. So it is a very nice, nice situation. The others decouple and um, okay. Is there a nice, I mean, apart from it, uh, when you had the transformation with the total momentum P. P That's P1. right. Uh -huh. So, mm, and the part, is it some other interpretation or it just comes out like this? It is the fact that, so again, you realize the conformal group by, by additively here, you know, mm -hmm. the, basically. So you have L1 plus L2 for all generators. But the, space-time description should be realizing the conformal group in ADS space as it is easily done as, as a curved space. Those two don't look the same. So you can ask the question, can I make them equal by a change of coordinates? The answer is no, by a change of coordinates, so you give up on the change of coordinates. Then you try change of momenta, which is the next simplest possibility. And yes, it works. It's remarkable that it works. It's just a curious fact. I don't know a deep answer why it is momentum space that it, it works. It's a simple mathematical fact. Which, but that's also the answer for why your CAT scan exists. The, that's the radon transform. Okay. Is there any comments? Yeah. Uh, if not, we have now the shortest break of our conference. Okay. Because there is an additional talk at quarter past five. So we just rush and do something. Thank you very much. Okay, good.